Hello and welcome to Strat News Global and welcome to The Gist, our signature show on foreign affairs and security. I'm Surya Gangadharan and uh, tonight our focus is on Tibet. Now, why is that so? Um, first of all, let me introduce my guest. Uh, he is Tenzin Lakshay, uh, director of the Central of the Tibet Policy Institute of the Central Tibetan Administration in Dharamshala. Welcome, sir. Good to have you. Thank you so much, Surya. And now let me tell you why we are focusing on Tibet. Now, a few days ago, China issued a white paper on Tibet. It's not a new development. They've been issuing white papers since the 1990s. And I am told that this is the 15th white paper they've issued. So um, what is the provocation this time? For that, we need to understand just what was in the white paper. So let me quickly go through a small graphics that we prepared for you. Uh, the white paper says that um, <clears throat> there have been historic changes in Tibet since the uh, country was liberated in 1951. Liberation is their term for occupation. As you're aware, China invaded and occupied Tibet in 1951. Uh, they've talked about uh, the complete victory over poverty. They say that traditional culture has been protected and further developed. Uh, they also say there's been remarkable progress, these are their words, remarkable progress in ethnic and religious work. And finally, they say Tibet is embarking on a new journey in the new era. So let's try and understand what they are trying to say here. So Tenzin, let me get back to my guest. Um, what is the provocation for this latest uh, white paper? Oh, uh, Surya, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, forum. So uh, let me first uh, tell you that uh, this white paper, in fact, uh, they call it 70 years and liberation development inside Tibet. Whatever they call it, right, uh, uh, it's not a liberation as such, as you rightly pointed out, it's an occupation, it's a brutal occupation in 1950, uh, since from 1951. Right, uh, of the the whole agreement was set up set up in a way that the delegation was uh, was forced to sign it, so it was not uh, not a legitimate one, and uh, even though they call it a liberation, right, they use so much of forces, Chinese PLA armies coming into Tibet, and then uh, kill thousands of Tibetan. And then uh, destroyed Tibetan monasteries. We, we used to say that there are more than 6,000 monasteries destroyed. So is it called a liberation? So uh, therefore, it's very really difficult to say uh, that whatever China projects in the white paper, so-called white paper for the last so many years, but this isn't a white paper, it's a black paper, right? That, uh, that gives a, a, a wrong narration of the Tibetan history. Right, that uh, shows uh, a wrong narration of what exactly happens inside Tibet as of now under the Chinese occupation. So therefore, uh, we simply reject what China says in, uh, in the Council of Tibet. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that there were uh, 15 odd uh, white papers they were issued. So where is the need to constantly come out with white papers? Does it in a sense reflect insecurity about uh, their hold over Tibet, about public attitudes towards their control over Tibet? Uh, yes, Surya, uh, to, to uh, give you this, uh, the straight answer, uh, there's a fear uh, growing inside the mindset of the Chinese hotliners, leaders. Uh, even though they call it since 70 years of liberation, but still, there is a grooming fear within the Chinese leader, thinking that they, uh, there isn't any stabilities, but uh, thinking that the Tibetan aspirations is going far away from the wishes, the political wishes of the Chinese government. So therefore, I believe that uh, uh, if you, if China, right, uh, is really, right, is really going to what they want to say, then first thing they need to do is they need to look into the aspirations of the Tibetan people inside Tibet. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they cannot do it on their own will, but for their own goods, for their own safety, for their own stability. So uh, to the, uh, if you look at past 70 years, whatever they have done, the number one priority is to fulfill their political need. 
right? It is not yeah. to to uh, to uh, accommodate the aspirations of Tibetan people. That was not there. So therefore, there is a grievances, right? And so far, if you look at the international community, there is a growing number of sentiments. There is a growing number of solidarities for the Tibet. So they mm -hmm. want the China uh, for consistently publishing the white paper on Tibet means that they want to impress upon the outside world that whatever they did inside Tibet is good for Tibetan people. So in fact, it is not. It contradicts, right? Whatever they say, it contradicts with whatever they are doing inside Tibet. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I find increasingly the Chinese are interested in this whole issue of the uh, succession to the Dalai Lama. And, um, um, you know, there's something odd about an officially atheist state uh, showing interest in reincarnation, the golden urn and all that, you know. So, <laughs> what what is going on? See, uh, if you look at the His Holiness statement of 2011, Right. His Holiness has categorically mentioned about how the reincarnation has to be taken place. What are the traditions of the Tibetan reincarnation system? So therefore, uh, if you look at China, right, since 1950s, right, the Mao Zedong and all the Chinese leaders, they whispers, right, by saying that religion is poison. Mm, religion yeah. is open. Right. So therefore, an ethics government, right, and now they believe that but being his, his holiness is of a stature where everybody, right, both inside and outside Tibetan, listen to, have a faith, right, and everybody listen to him, right. So therefore, uh, they believe that the, the whole 70 years of Tibetan occupation still didn't work out very well because his holiness mm -hmm. is in India. So the, the tactic which they uh, play around is if they have the authority for the next Dalai Lama, that means that they believe that everybody will go in the Chinese stand. Direction. Mm -hmm. Right, direction. So therefore, but they do it only for the political reason. Not because of their, not because having a sentiment for the religious belief. Not because of their uh, uh, willful desire to right, propagate the Tibetan religious sentiments. But inside Tibet, if you look at Tibet right now, right, the religious sentiments are being crushed. Mm -hmm. right. In reality, right, they want to wipe away the Tibetan aspirations, they want to wipe away the Tibetan cultures, traditions, everything, but they want to own the legitimacy of this, uh, this incarnation thing, which mm -hmm. is historically not deserving for China. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, uh, the religious sentiments or reincarnation thing, I think China, whatever they do, will, will doom to fail. It's going to doom to fail because what happens is they strictly do not look through the spiritual angle, spiritual traditions. And uh, moreover, now, whatever they do is uh, they want to uh, create a kind of legacy by saying that the Tibetan tradition, the Buddhist tradition, is a Chinese characterizations. Never before they used to say the Tibetan tradition as a Chinese characterizations. Even in the white paper also they, used to, they say that, right? To make Tibetan Buddhism as a China's characterization. So this, they try to rewrite the history. They try to rewrite the Tibetan Buddhist traditions, but in actual terms, they are doing not a favor, not to the Tibetan, not to the Chinese. Right. So it's a lie. Yes, Let him lie. Mm -hmm. Just explain to me, uh, the Dalai Lama, the uh, whole issue of reincarnation starts only after the Dalai Lama passes away. Um, so uh, has the Dalai Lama given any indication as to uh, who his successor is or where the successor will come from? Any indication at all? Uh, yes. Uh, his Holiness, over a number of times, His Holiness says that if the present situation inside Timen, Tibet remains same, he will no longer be born in Tibet. He will not be born in Tibet. Uh -huh. Right. So, so the situation inside Tibet is still very critical. Right. 
if you look at the religious side, if you look at the spiritual, if you look at culture, it's still not in favor of the Tibetan people, right? Mm. It is still dark. So unless until the Tibetan issue resolves, right, His Holiness will not be born in in uh, in Tibet under the Chinese occupation. But uh, but His Holiness categorically mentioned that that uh, in if you look at 2011 remarks statement by His Holiness, He also says mm. uh, when His Holiness becomes 90 years old, then he, His Holiness will be much more clear in giving instructions about what should be done. Right. Okay. So therefore, uh, we uh, it's a purely a special matter, and we are talking about His Holiness incarnation. So it uh, it matters only with His Holiness. His mm. Holiness alone has the legitimate right to tell where he should be born, right, and when he should be born, right. So mm. therefore, it is not up to the Chinese government. It's not up to us by saying that His Holiness won't be here, here, here. So it's a matter of his holiness, right? Uh, uh, alone, and his holiness office, right? So the legitimate right for reincarnation of his holiness goes to uh, goes only to his holiness. Mm -hmm. So what if China tomorrow appoints says this child is the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, and they the Chinese government recognizes him? What happens then? <laughs> so. Uh, uh, this is not the first time they, they've been doing that. They did with Penjin Lama. Right. Uh, Penjin yeah. Lama, when the 10th one passed away, mysteriously, mm -hmm. right, there were lots of theories about it. Uh, but still, when he passed away, the, the new one, right, when his holiness recognized that one, soon after that, the Penjin Lama disappeared in yeah. 1995. Right. Now, uh, he's an adult. Right. Since when he was six years old, he disappeared with his right, parents. Nobody knows, yeah. even the UN. Right. Even the world communities, even though we have we put so much efforts in finding whether he's alive or not, but he's not he, still now we couldn't know. Right. Mm -hmm. So therefore, now they have appointed their own pension lama. Right. And uh, occasionally he visits Tibet when yeah. China needs him to visit Tibet yeah. to show to the world that everything is fine, beautiful, good happening inside Tibet. But look at the sentiments of the Tibetan. Whether the majority of the Tibetans believe in him or not, it's very difficult to say. Yeah. Still, if you look at inside Tibet, still you will not find even a portrait of the Chinese appointed Panchen Lama. Mm -hmm. Right. If the Tibetan people inside Tibet have a full faith on the Chinese appointed Panchen Lama, but they could have easily put the portrait of the, him yeah, as a mark yeah. of respect to the spiritual leader, mm. but nowhere you will find that one. So that means that people do not believe in what the Chinese government has done. So same thing in the future, right? Even though uh, right, China play a trait in appointing their own Dalai Lama, but the faith of the people will not be there. So if there is, a, there, is, there is an absence of faith among the Tibetan people, will it serve their purpose, a political purpose? Mm -hmm. uh, not. Mm -hmm. Good point, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, because what happens is the whole purpose is not about the uh, sentiments, religious sentiments, it's about the political objectivity, yeah. right? So they, if they want to appoint somebody, it need to fulfill the objective, right? Political objective. But in the future, if they don't believe in what his son says, they don't go in the line what his son says, they criticize him. At one time, he, they, he, he was being labeled as a demon, right? But now they are so eager to recognize him. So it's very contradictory of their behavior, but they need to do it for their own political right, uh, thing. So uh, if China appoints his holiness in the future, I, I don't think the majority of the Tibetan people, not just Tibetan, but all Buddhist uh, communities who believe in the Tibetan Buddhism will not accept it. Mm -hmm. And that will hinder their own political objectivity. Rather, no. I would suggest, rather, yeah. I would suggest that if the Chinese leaders are wise enough 
they need to listen to what his son says. Yeah. They need to compliment. <laughs> they need to compliment what his son says. That will give a much more leverage for China. But yeah. they are opposite to that. Right. So now, uh, yeah, I'd like to come to the issue of, um, you know, the uh, Tibetan uh, diaspora. Now, we know the largest uh, number of Tibetans are still in India. For how long? I don't know. But currently, the largest number of Tibetans to be found anywhere in the world is in India. Yes. Now, uh, as the population, Tibetan population in other parts of the world increases, I presume due to uh, you know people migrating from here to other parts of the world, could we see a shift in um, uh, how... Uh, Tibet is viewed, could there be less of that ambiguity which characterizes India's dealing with Tibet? See, uh, what what we believe as a Tibetan, right? because see, uh, first thing is, normally I jokingly say that Tibetan, Tibetans are nomadic people, they go for greener pastures. Wherever they, so, but in a way, uh, Tibetan people, when they are scattered to different countries, more than 30 different countries, Right. And it uh, gives a kind of, a, I think, uh, more power for the Tibetans to right, raise the Tibetan issue in the international forum, first day. Right. And uh, Tibet issue is not an issue of Tibet alone. It's an international issue. It's the longest surviving issue right, mm -hmm. in the world. It's a struggle. Longest, it's been more than 90, 60 years. Right. In front of our eyes, we see new nations coming up. But we struggle still now. We are still striving. We are still resilient. So therefore, even though the Tibetans are scattered over the world, but they became a representative of the Tibetan in their own respective host countries. Right? Our voice will must be connected to all of the world. Right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, they are, but I would remind that still India has the largest Tibetan community. Right. So uh, normally I used to say that uh, we need to look from the different perspectives because after the Chinese, after the Chinese occupation of Tibet, India, right, as the uh, India uh, faced a problem, direct problems, direct consequences. So therefore, mm -hmm. it's our common objective. It's our common cause. So therefore, uh, we need to understand, we need to uh, galvanize our solidarities on the cause of Tibet, not by thinking that it is just for the sympathy's sake, but it, it should we have an action-oriented right, uh, support in India, not just for the sake of Tibetan, but for India's own goodwill, India's own security issues. But you see that very well over the last couple of years, how India faced different problems on the borders. So the there younger, are the, uh, the, yes. the younger lot of Tibetans at Tenzin, younger Tibetan, uh, Tibetan young people, uh, do they share the uh, Dalai Lama's thing about middle way, peaceful and all that stuff? Or are they in favor of more militant forms of uh, uh, opposition to China's rule? See, Surya, uh, since we are brought up in a democratic system, right, we have a, a liberty of, uh, of having a freedom of uh, expressions, thoughts. So uh, even about the young Tibetans, right? Uh, they are different. Some of them they align to the uh, uh, CTA's policy of middle way, and some mm -hmm. they are uh, more towards the independence. Because uh, what we feel is that historically Tibet was independent, right? Whatever China says in the white paper, right, is uh, kind of rewriting the history of Tibet for yeah. their own favor. But in fact, right, Tibet was independent, right, and it's a well known fact. So, therefore, uh, there are young people who are somewhat desperate because it's a long struggle, right, and China was not willful enough. They don't have a uh, political will to resolve the issue. So, they yeah. want to impress upon by saying that we can earn. What we deserve, that is the freedom, that is the independence. Right. 
so as uh, uh, we used to say in the Indian freedom struggle, Savraj is my birthright. I shall have it. <laughs> right. So therefore, even among the Tibetan, young Tibetans, there is a right uh, narration. There is a perception of longing for independent Tibet. But somehow the CTA's policy is a middle way policy. Right. Uh, as his audience rightly says, we live in a global heart. We are all interdependent, right? So we can, although rather than being an independent, forget about the past. Past, we are independent, but in the future, right? In the future, we can be, a, a, I would say, uh, that uh, productive. Uh, even among the India-China relations, we can be a bridge. We can remain not just as a buffer, but as a bridge, because we have the, the traditions, the Buddhist traditions, which are very much preserved, right? So therefore, uh, it can help, right? Both China, Tibet, the global communities, right? If we try to make a dialogue with China on the military policy, it's a win-win solution. But somehow, China's Chinese government lack the political will to resolve the issue. They mm -hmm. still put a hardline policies on Tibet, and they only knows how to repress mm -hmm. and oppress. Mm -hmm. That's the so, la Okay. Last question, uh, Tenzin. Uh, I would like you to spell out exactly what uh, changes you would like in India's policy towards Tibet. What is it that you would like this government to do? You know, uh, Can you spell it out, please? Exactly what you would like us to do? Uh, see, Surya, uh, there are many things which uh, we uh, wish us for. But somehow we are very grateful to the Indian government and the public uh, for uh, for supporting us, right? Uh, human uh, through humanitarian works so. or, but somehow I feel that uh, India or Indian government need to look from the different perspectives by thinking that this is not about the uh, sympathy or emotions. This is about the reality. This is about the rational way of helping Tibet to help India. Right. It's not just, just about helping Tibet, right? but it's about helping India. So they need to look from the different perspective of how to support Tibet. And also, I believe that the international, uh, the Indian leaders, the politicians, right, they, and uh, of course the masses, right, they need to be aware of what's happening inside Tibet. Yeah. Right. Though there is a growing sympathy among Tibetan. But they don't exactly know what is Tibet to going on, what's going on inside exactly. Tibet. And uh, I, I, I would understand about the Mars, but even among the strategic communities, there's a lack of understanding on Tibet. Mm -hmm. Right. And therefore, what I felt is uh, there should be more Tibetan studies program in the Indian universities. Mm. One thing, right. And there should be more vocal about right, helping the Tibetan issues. Right. For the sake of India's need also. Mm -hmm. So there are many practical ways to help Tibet. Right. In a more kind of a, uh, I would say that if, even if it's uh, very difficult for Indian government to challenge China, but we are not asking Ch India to confront China. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. The whole middle way is not about confronting. It's about yeah. dialogue. It's about right accommodations. So therefore, it'll be very easy for India to look into right, those goals and build upon their own right, solidarities mm -hmm. for the Tibetan issue. So, um, Tenzin Lakshay, it's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. Clearly, um, there are no um, uh, easy way forward, given the manner in which China continues to preserve its um, uh, prize, its uh, repressive hold over Tibet and um, their uh, constant meddling in uh, matters of religion when uh, Mao himself has said that uh, religion is poison. So clearly there are many contradictions there. Uh, India's policy too needs to be uh, finessed even more, uh, possibly with something far more um, uh, proactive in terms of doing something for Tibet and the Tibetans here in this country. Uh, Tenzin Lakshay, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, clearly, this is not the first conversation we'll have on this. There'll be many more uh, in instances and issues coming up. Uh, thank you very much. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Surya. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Pleasure, Bedi.
So that's all we have for you now on the gist. Uh, continue to track us on Instagram, on other social media. Uh, bring us your comments, observations. We'd be glad to answer them whenever we can. And uh, keep following us on our website, uh, statnewsglobal.com. Looking forward to meeting you guys again. Keep watching.